So our next speaker, our second of the two students, is Sarah Goking, who is a PhD candidate in the USU Department of Watershed Science, and she's working with Dr. David Tarbotten. Her dissertation examines how forest dynamics affect stream flow using forest inventory data in a spatially distributed hydrologic model. Sarah is also an analyst for the U.S. Forest Service's Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, where her most recent work quantified the west-wide decline and regeneration status of white, white bark pine. Thank you, Clint. Good morning, everybody. Today I'm going to talk about the state of the science um, regarding forest disturbance and water yield response. Uh, like some of our presentations yesterday, I'm going to go straight to the end. I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you what I'm going to tell you. First, forest disturbance does not always increase water yield. And second, in some cases, snowpack may melt earlier uh, or there may be less total snow accumulation following disturbance. And that's important because it has implications for growing season soil moisture as well as the timing and total magnitude of peak flows. So the idea that forest loss leads to increased water yield is older than the Forest Service. And about a century or more of um, experimental forest studies have verified that stand replacing disturbances, uh, mainly clear cutting, do lead to increased water yield. This is an example from the Fraser Experimental Forest in Colorado where they had two paired watersheds. They measured stream flow for several years. Then they did the clear cutting that you see here in one watershed and continued to measure stream flow. The mechanism is increasing evapotranspiration from uh, these watersheds. So when you remove the forest cover, uh, the trees are no longer intercepting precipitation, so there's no canopy sublimation of snow, no evaporation from the canopy, and then no transpiration. This paradigm led to the expectation that when trees started dying um, across a really broad scale across the West over the last 15 or so years, that we would get increases in water yield. It was sort of projected to be the silver lining to all this mortality. Beginning about five years ago, papers started to be, be published that showed um, this was not always the case. So I decided to do a synthesis of papers published since 2000 looking at this topic. Um, and I started by just doing keyword searches looking for papers that had keywords pertaining to forest mortality, tree mortality, and runoff, stream flow, or water yield. Um, that gave me about 300 papers, and then when I focused them down, on western coniferous forests, I ended up with 68. And those papers included both stand replacing disturbances, such as severe fire and uh, clear cutting, as well as non stand replacing disturbances that fractionally reduce the tree cover. So that includes drought and insects and lower severity fire. I asked these, these main questions of each paper. First, when and where was the paper published? I thought there might be a difference um, just based on when the tree mortality occurred and when people started realizing that the predominant paradigm wasn't being observed. Uh, then I also asked the, the main question, did water yield increase following forest disturbance? Not every paper directly measured water yield or stream flow. A lot of them looked at uh, snowpack, so snow accumulation and retention, uh, because that's, that's one of the main ways of predicting any season stream flow. And then finally, I asked, how did these studies characterize forests and disturbance? So my, my first question, when and where were they published? I did find out that um, the years up until about 2009, I referred to those as the years when we had everything figured out and, and forests and watersheds were behaving as we thought they would. Um, there started to be a lot more papers in 2012 and that's continuing now. Another thing I want to mention is that the, the forestry journals have only had one or two papers per year on this topic, while the hydrology journals and the cross-disciplinary journals, including eco-hydrology, um, they're the ones that have really picked up on this. So the next, the next question, the big question, did water yield increase following forest disturbance? 
In observational studies that directly measured streamflow response to disturbance, they were equally likely to find increases, decreases, or no change in water yield, contrary to the expectation. This was not a Jedi mind trick. Um, actually, we, I, I wondered why would there be this expectation, and it's, it's not being met in most cases. And uh, I found that simulations almost universally predicted increases in stream flow, even though the observations weren't showing that, and also studies that observed stream flow following stand replacing disturbance did find increases in stream flow. So that suggests there's a big difference between the stand replacing and non-stand replacing disturbances. And so in the non-stand replacing disturbances, sometimes stream flow actually decreased. So all of these uh, papers finding um, results that were contrary to expectations required people to hypothesize why weren't the expectations met. Um, the most fundamental principle in hydrology is that precipitation is equal to runoff plus evapotranspiration. So we've gone back to this relationship. Trees affect the partitioning of precipitation into runoff and ET. So they affect the amount of overstory or canopy evaporation, then there's also evaporation from the understory and the soil, transpiration from the canopy and the understory, and then sublimation of canopy intercepted snow and directly from the snowpack. So when there's a forest disturbance, um, if it's a stand replacing disturbance, the, the things with the blue arrows go down more than the things with the red arrows go up. In the case of non-stand replacing disturbance, when stream flows were not observed to increase, it was thought that the things with the red arrows were increasing more than the, the blue arrows were decreasing. So the main drivers were really transpiration of surviving vegetation, especially uh, advanced regeneration of trees in the understory, as well as sublimation of the snowpack. And that's driven by radiation. So here, here's an example of a, a study that looked at eight watersheds. These are mountain, pe mountain pine beetle affected watersheds in central Colorado. And they used three different methods um, to account for precipitation differences before and after the disturbances um, and found that only one watershed had a, a decrease detected, or any change at all actually, um, detected by any of these methods and it was a decrease. So the most statistically robust method also suggested there were decreases in other watersheds. Um, the authors of this study hypothesized it was because of uh, the two responses I mentioned, increased transpiration from the understory and increased sublimation from the snowpack. They did another study that I won't present here, but they actually did find increased vapor loss from the beetle-affected stands compared to pre-outbreak and pre-mortality. So I mentioned that that sublimation um, piece has a lot to do with radiation. Tree density affects the amount of radiation reaching the snowpack. And, so, and, and that's important both for shortwave or solar radiation and also longwave radiation. Trees block solar radiation. They also absorb energy from the sun and from um, the water that they're uptaking. And then they emit longwave radiation. So the image on the right here is, this is a thermal image. Uh, the redder the color, the higher the long wave radiation being emitted. So the tree, the tree trunks are bright red, those are live trees. The ground surface is yellow, and then there are a few places that are green on the ground. So those are, op those are uh, gaps in the canopy, um, and provided that they don't get a lot of solar radiation, those are going to be the places that retain snow the longest in the spring, most likely. So radiation also varies with aspect, and the effect of tree cover on snowpack um, also varies with aspect. On this graph, I'm, I'm um, using a study from the Canadian Rockies. It shows two clearings. The one circled in blue is on a north-facing slope. The one circled in red is on a south-facing slope. The two lines that aren't circled are forest stands. One is north and one is south-facing. 
Um, the things that I want to point out is as you go through the year, this is date of year beginning January 1st and going until midsummer, uh, beginning at about day 115, the south-facing clearing starts to lose snowpack, likely due to sublimation and increased melt um, as, so, as the solar angle gets higher. So, so snow's disappearing first from the south-facing opening. Um, then in all, at all the sites, snow really starts to decrease starting at about day 130. The effect of trees on snow retention on the south-facing slopes is that by providing solar shade, they're retaining snow longer. On the north-facing slopes, the trees are emitting enough long-wave radiation that they're losing snow faster than the clearings. So forest density is important, um, but aspect can also moderate the effect of, of trees on radiation. Not only is forest density important, but forest structure is important. And if you're a backcountry skier, you can just look at the picture and enjoy because you already know what I'm going to tell you here. And that's that um, there, the, the greatest amount of snow accumulation and retention occurs near the trees. So near the trees, you have, you have uh, the canopies there that are providing some solar shading. They're creating these micro eddies and wind redistributed snow is deposited there. Um, and also there's very little interception. So density and structure are both important. Okay, my, my last question was how did these studies characterize forests and disturbances? Most of them characterize either entire catchments or portions of catchments as forest versus non-forest and disturbed versus undisturbed. So that doesn't really fit with what I've said about forest density and forest structure being important. Uh, second, a small number of studies collected really detailed forestry measurements, and then they did not relate them to hydrologic processes in any quantitative way. They were just sort of presented as a series of summary statistics. Third and finally, some studies used leaf area index. Almost every study that quantitatively related forest conditions to hydrologic response used leaf area index. So I work for the largest forest inventory program um, in, in North America, and we collect hundreds of variables on our plots, and we don't collect leaf area index. So I think this is a gap between forestry and hydrology, and if we want to be able to make better predictions about where and how water yield and snow retention are going to respond to forest disturbance, we need to close that gap between the disciplines. That's the rest of my dissertation work that I won't talk about today. So coming back to the beginning, um, in conclusion, uh, the best available scientific information suggests that forest disturbance does not always increase water yield. And in some stands, uh, it may actually result in earlier snow melt, less snow retention, which can lead to uh, earlier peak flows as well as lower growing season soil moisture. So that's important for future forest resilience. A few things that um, managers might want to consider, managing forests with the objective of increasing water yield is unlikely to produce consistent outcomes and it may result in less snow retention. Silvicultural prescriptions, such as thinning and fuels treatments, um, can mimic some of the non-stand replacing disturbances that, that I synthesized here. Um, there are good reasons to do those treatments, but increasing water yield is probably not a defensible one. Last but not least, the best available scientific information is changing rapidly, and this is an exciting time to be involved in this area of research. Thank you. Any questions? Up front here? Yeah. I was wondering if any of these papers that you found talk about the trade off between uh, water quality and quantity. So, in other words, how might these different disturbance regimes impact the quality of the water, even if it's increasing or decreasing? Yeah, some of, some of them did. Um, most studies tended to focus more on, qual on quantity, and I know there's an entirely, there's a big body of literature just dealing with water quality effects of these disturbances. 
Um, and one thing that I didn't mention is that some of them, especially the more severe fires, they're projected to increase, which is going to increase sedimentation. So there's that aspect of water quality. Another is um, that following these beetle outbreaks, when you have a, you know, a pulse of needles hitting the ground and then decomposing and then you know, being flushed, um, that, that has water quality implications too. So that's another big area of research that where a lot's being learned right now. Is there a question up front here? Composition is important, and it's the least uh, quantified and least well understood. There are actually a lot of studies from the 60s and 70s where, where um, people tried to weigh trees, and they would compare species. So, so based on the species architecture, their branch architecture, I'm going like this because I'm, trying to, I'm doing the interpretive dance thing of catching snow. <laughs> and some trees can hold a lot of snow, and other trees, if they're really flexible, they shed snow. Um, I know Jessica Lundquist uh, is looking at this in the Pacific Northwest, um, but in general, I don't think, I, I think we're already so data limited as far as the, the density and the structure, and getting the information to look at uh, composition is down the road probably. That's a good question. It is important. Question in the back. Yes, they did. That was actually, there are a lot of sub-questions that I didn't cover here, and that was one of them, was did they look either at actual forcing data, or if they were using simulation models, you know, what projections did they use, and did they include the effects of future climate on forest dynamics? Most of them didn't do that piece, so they didn't account for the fact that, you know, warmer temperatures, altered precipitation might lead to different forest patterns. Um, but they, most of them did um, look at the effect of increasing temperature on radiation and predicted change increases in sublimation and decreases in soil moisture. Any more questions? Okay, uh, extra credit to Sarah also for working a Star Wars reference into her presentation. <laughs> so, anyway, thanks, Sarah. Thank you.